Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Hello to our live stream attendees. Uh, welcome to Lift Economy's Building Resilient Communities event. Can folks hear me in the back? My name is Erin Axelrod. I'm a worker owner partner at Lift Economy. And we're really, really grateful to Arup for holding this space. This is the second time we've used your space and very grateful. So I wanted to give Francis a few minutes to just share a little bit about what Arup is, this building that we are situated in. Um, and it, which has been so generous in supporting these events. And then we'll, um, just to give you a general arc of the agenda, we're gonna have um, a brief kind of intro to the topic from the Lyft team, and then we'll have a bit of interactivity so you get to talk amongst yourselves. Then we'll have Nasi speak about uh, the built environment. Letitia will speak about uh, workforce development, and then Cassie will speak about Cliff, and then we'll have more time for interactivity and questions. Um, but first, Francis. Thanks for being yeah, here. Yeah, welcome. Um, we are uh, somewhat new to this space, and we're we're filling it out and and um, having you know hosting events like this uh, for organizations like Lyft has been one of the desires for this space in Oakland. Um, we our original San Francisco office um, has been there for uh, twenty years, but this is our first year in Oakland, um, and we're very excited about groups like yours. Um, we do uh, we're so we're a uh, um, employee owned um, uh, like a profit share company and um, we have uh, 10,000 people globally actually I think maybe closer to 12,000 now um, our US offices there's eight of them and we, we focus on the built environment so um, infrastructure planning and engineering um, and uh, yeah our look our motto is we shape a better world um, we're uh, very aware of um, how important it is to join up with um, groups like yourselves and, and how um, the design and engineering have to work with the financing side, um, the great entrepreneurs and um, all of this, you know, wider ecosystem of how to create that better world. Um, so um, I'm really um, happy to get to be here tonight. I think my colleague Raphael was here at the last event and, um, and so I get to kind of absorb and hear about what it is you all do. And, and yeah, we'll look forward to more collaborations. Thank you. Um, the restrooms, or if anyone comes in that hallway, the um, so we can see the Yeah, thank you. Great. So, um, Lift Economy, our mission is to create, model, and share a locally self reliant just an inclusive economy that works for the benefit of all life. So um, we are, we do a lot of consulting directly with social enterprises. Um, we do consulting with kind of grassroots entrepreneurs on, on up to larger B corporations. Many of, how many of you are familiar with B corporations? Okay, so the B Corp movement. Um, we also have a small fund called the Force for Good Fund. Um, that we started in 2016 with a mission to kind of transform the norms and some of the toxic culture around how capital flows in our world, typically only to white men. And so we wanted to actually kind of flip that upside down and our Force for Good Fund was created with the intentionality around investing in women and person of color owned enterprises, um, addressing some of our greatest challenges, including food security, energy security, um, and uh, so that's another place that we kind of play in the next economy ecosystem. Many of you may have seen our podcast. Anybody next economy now listeners? Um, so we have a podcast as well. Um, and more recently, we've been doing field building, uh, which we'll, we'll go into more tonight around what that looks like. Um, but for us, that really has been about um, recognizing that individual enterprises as individual entities cannot of their own accord transform, right? A lot of what we're, what we're dealing with are systems, um, systems of oppression, systems of extraction and exploitation, and so we need systemic approaches. And so we've looked at particular industries of interest and said, hey, there needs to be more collaboration. There needs to be less siloization in certain um, sectors. Um, and we've selected ones that we have amazing leaders in to, to feature um, when we started doing these events to kind of 
build our collective literacy and awareness around what is possible in the field to actually transform a whole sector, sector or industry. Um, yeah, I think that's enough about Lyft Economy. Maybe Kevin, um, co-founder of Lyft Economy, uh, could share a little bit about our field building. Well, so when we talk about field building, one of the what, the newest field building issue we have is building resilient communities. And go ahead and kind of feature, what does that mean though? Um, there's a number of elements or components in a field that we see disconnected. And one of them as an example is this idea of regenerative forest management. Uh, thinning round poles turns out can reduce carbon lows and actually increase biodiversity and soil carbon capture. Uh, within forests, and there's a material economic yield that could be achieved from that, but some of the technology and innovation around those yields is still to be developed. But we can get trusses that can span long distances, large distances, um, and actually use uh, round wood in our built environment so that we have uh, light manufacturing and carbon sequestration within our built environment, go ahead, um, while achieving some fire reduction. So this is one of the elements, regenerative forest management is yet, as of yet, an element that's under underexplored in the economy. Um, go ahead. Um, so, but so is as we'll hear tonight from Massey, this idea of taking cellulose and embedding it into buildings uh, to have uh, straw bale and also to, of course, enclose it in case our buildings with natural earthen plasters, which makes them fire resistant, resistant to catastrophe. That's another element, um, and they're separate, right? And there's different people working on different things, but you can see that there's some connection between them because hybrid buildings that are using round poles with cellulose and other carbon sequestration mechanisms within the within the actual material itself are complementary. Go ahead. But there's other elements too, because these both play into actually preparing us for catastrophe um, by reducing fire load and of course in making our buildings more resilient in the case of when there are fires. But there's also other things that are being funded and initiatives that are being uh, explored, uh, rural economic development or economic development in general, finding livelihoods and job opportunities, workforce development. Um, and those are connected because we actually need reskilling around some of these different elements around how to manage a forest appropriately, how to, <coughs> how to build a building. Um, but also the, the straw that might go in those buildings, can it come from a land base where there's carbon sequestration practices and uh, soil health practices in the management of land. So regenerative agriculture is connected to this field. Um, and there's initiatives, funding, efforts, social enterprises, organizations working on regenerative agriculture, which also increases the humidity of the soil, which re reduces fire risk. And then of course, there's a number of initiatives working on edible landscaping, kind of for food security, putting food right around the homes for food security, food reliance, but also increasing the general humidity around our settlements such that when fire comes through, it moves a lot slower if there's rainwater cisterns and uh, uh, different conservation hydrology practices and green infrastructure in and around. Um, so those are connected. Also renewable electricity microgrids. We know a number of the fires, the Tubbs fire, and the Woolsey sparked by long tra transmission lines of electricity. We know we have better technology, so there are people working on microgrids. But these efforts, all these efforts um, that are in this field are largely disconnected, <laughs> not working together, chasing different forms of capital or funding and finding themselves stressed to compete with the exploitation economy and the usual norms. Um, but the connections between them that a renewable electricity microgrid actually prepares us better for cat catastrophic fire, or mitigates the risk of fire. Um, go ahead, keep on, keep on going a little bit. Yeah, also, but changing the nature of ownership of our and, and actual settlements is actually an essential component of building resilience. Resilience for who? It's gotta be resilience for everybody or else it's not actually resilient. Um, it's not including everybody. So finding ways to change the ownership structures of land. Uh, and then of course the impact capital marketplace looking for opportunities in all these different areas, but largely disconnected and siloed. We need to change the way insurance works to actually make some of these things possible. Trillions of dollars in the insurance industry and those premiums are going to what? Actually propping up the exploitation economy and the business way of settling humanity. And even things like zoning come into play. All of these things together, we suggest are, are actually connected 
um, in order to create resilient communities. And if we're really intelligent about stacking how these efforts align and connecting and partnering and then lining up capital, a dollar spent on one could be a dollar spent on more than one or three or four of them. Um, so this type of relational building is the work that Lift Economy does and when we say we do field building. Um, we do see, of course, Aaron mentioned, we actually do consulting with and do capital formation for particular enterprises. And we do see at least a few emergent ones within this field that we're looking for entrepreneurs. So if you want to start the Climate Change Insurance Cooperative, I need you um, because we have a lot of things moving. But if you're into insurance, like if you think insurance is sexy, talk to me because I, I, I need to talk to you. Um, so that's that's a field, but there's other fields that we work on. So um, the other arena we work in is regenerative agriculture. Um, we work with a network of investors around the country. Uh, we have it called our RAIN, Regenerative Agriculture Investor Network. Um, and we're working actually to help regenerative um, investors that are looking to step into the space um, understand a little bit better the realities on the ground for um, for implementation for the, for the farmers and for the um, land stewards. We have a restorative oceans initiative. Actually, Bren Smith is going to be speaking here tomorrow in San Francisco at a bookstore. Um, I forget which bookstore, but I can tell you at the end. Um, and he's been in innovating this really incredible initiative to do a polyculture approach of raising kelp, oysters, bivalves um, on long lines and actually creating habitat that is uh, superior to marine protected areas. It's actually transforming the nature of the oceans die off that we are seeing around our oceans. Um, so we work on that. Uh, we and partner with Greenwave. Greenwave and Brent Smith are leaders there. Um, and so all of these together, this restorative ocean economies, regenerative agriculture, building resilient communities, um, Together, there are overlays and parallels where they connect to one another. Um, so the investment connects to building resilient communities. The oceans connects to material culture and the ways we feed um, feed human populations. Um, and we see that as the, the collaborative, iterative, emergent next economy. of our work um, and you might think this is all Pollyannish like the, the resilient communities work and uh, oh that's really nice that there's uh, round poles that could be harvested and turned into trusses and carbon sequestering buildings but it's also true simultaneously that California lost 31,444 structures over the last two years to catastrophic fire and with these spring rains um, we're likely to have a massive carbon load this summer and if we get that zero humidity kind of October day um, it's likely that we'll lose more again, probably every year for the rest of our lives. And the, so the prospect of us rebuilding to from fire or the inexorable sea level rise, we're already in the Bay Area. We have $165 billion worth of infrastructure at risk over the next 35 years just from sea level rise. The idea that humanity is going to be rebuilding large settlements almost from scratch or in a greenfield environment, not just retrofitting, is imminent. Um, and so it is kind of fantasy land, but I think preparing for making these fields work so that every time we do rebuild, we either build toxic stick frame exploitation economy crap, or we can build biodiversity enhancing, carbon sequestering, beautiful resilient communities with food and water security that meet everybody's needs with no one left out. Um, that's the opportunity in front of us. But in this field of building resilient communities, which one of those elements that we just talked about is most important? question. I'd love for you to break out into groups of maybe four or five or people around you and answer that question. Which one is most important and why?
Maybe makes me think of even more broadly who is missing from this conversation too. <laughs> hmm. So we want to bring up Massey. Um, thank you so much for your leadership in this space. Massey Burke is a natural builder, um, co-director at CASBA, the California Straw Builders Association, um, and has been quite an inspiration to me about just bringing my mind, opening my mind to new possibilities of how our landscapes and our buildings can look. So Massey. Come on up. <laughs> um, cool. Thanks for being here. A quick note about the California Straw Building Association. Um, if you are, it, this crowd is probably familiar with and interested in natural building as a whole. Um, and CASBA uh, has had this name forever, but it's, and so it's focused on straw and straw bale building, but it's actually uh, sort of the, the West Coast and in part, the National Umbrella Organization for forwarding natural building in various ways. And so I'll be talking about it a bit. But just so you know, it's one of the entities that's becoming very active in this area uh, for the built environment in particular. Um, so uh, I've given this segment in a bunch of different forms. And this time, I'm calling it the Drawdown Building Report. 
the reason for that is that um, I like the phrase drawdown building, but my focus is looking at the built environment um, through the lens of responding to climate change. Um, and what I'll do a little bit this time is, is also really try to capture what Kevin and Aaron talked about as a whole, which is that by addressing climate change through the built environment and through sequestering carbon in buildings, you're also able to address five or six other things, you know, and so how do you, how do you, um, how do you zoom in on something enough so that you can focus and accomplish tangible movements, but also still consider the ecosystem benefits of what you're doing. So the drawdown building, and also uh, Mia, a good friend of mine who is here, requested that I begin to report on what's happening in this field, like as in an, on an ongoing basis. So that's why it's called the, the drawdown building report, May 2019. <laughs> okay. Mm. Uh, oh, I should say community resilience. So I don't, we'll see how the, I, I, I confess I was finishing my slides like in the corner over here. So hopefully they'll come through. Um, I would just scoot it over. Anyway, it doesn't matter that much if the other ones came through, but there you go. Uh, it really just my point was looking at community resilience uh, uh, in, in particular how we build communities uh, and the materials we use to build communities as a source of that resilience. All right, next one. So what we're trying to do, there you go, perfect. Um, when you're looking at built environments um, and climate change, but also a lot of other things that we're addressing tonight, uh, in the big picture, you're really, you're look. this is where we're at right now. You know, so the, the built environment and the biosphere are uh, two separate things addressed separately. They don't necessarily complement each other. Um, and the big energy flows kind of work like this. Uh, you know, so you sink a whole bunch of money into making buildings. Um, and the buildings give you a place to live and all sorts of other good things, but they also give you a whole lot of carbon dioxide um, into the atmosphere, both through building the buildings and operating the buildings. Um, they return a lot of waste and toxins to various parts of the biosphere, um, and they suck a lot of materials out of the biosphere. So what we're trying to do uh, in, in resilient building or drawdown building is go from this picture to this picture. Um, so this is what I would call regenerative building. Um, and this is actually not Pollyanna. We have all the tools to do this, and it's really more a question of learning how to scale it up. Um, so creating a built environment that's integrated with the biosphere and is a piece of it, um, and again, looking at the major energy flows, when you invest money in the built environment, it flows into the built environment, but through the built environment back into the biosphere. So you're actually building buildings you're using money to build buildings that give back to the environment, um, both by sequestering carbon, uh, by supporting regenerative supply chains, doing various other things, but those are the two big ones. Um, and carbon is being sequestered throughout the picture, in the buildings, in the environment, um, and waste and materials become the same thing. Um, and of course, the, uh, man, that watercolor keeps coming out dark. Um, the context that allows us to think about the built environment in this way is carbon drawdown. You know, so the growth of ecosystem thought um, and then zooming in on pieces of that ecosystem and figuring out how each piece uh, works to benefit the whole, but also it works in the pattern of the whole. So you, there, you get the cycling effect that I just described. Hmm. Um, okay, so uh, when you think about buildings, how do you do this? Uh, and there are a few things you need to know about buildings and climate change. Uh, one, buildings are a high leverage place to work. Um, they're responsible for a whole lot of carbon emissions, both building them and operating them. Um, and then two and three are how that impact breaks down when you're looking just through the lens of carbon emissions. Um, so you got to think about operational emissions, which come from running a building, uh, and embodied carbon, um, which comes from making all the carbon that goes into, that is emitted in the process of making building materials and assembling them into a building. Um, and then for how these two things relate to each other. So just a, again, a side note on where we're at right now. Um, you're probably very familiar with net zero construction, which addresses operational emissions only and doesn't really address the carbon impact of the building envelope, the materials that go into it. And so now everybody's really excited about addressing embodied carbon because when you combine those two things, that's when you really get to what we call real zero for buildings. <laughs> Um, a quick note on embodied carbon in buildings, and if anybody wants to hear a lot more about this, I'll bend your ear about it forever, um, but it's, I think, one slide in this presentation. Um, the, 
when you're looking specifically at how to make buildings, um, and I'll talk a little more about this, but what's powerful about looking at building materials as opposed to operational emissions from buildings is that, that the material of the building links you to the ecosystem that made the material. And there's where you have a whole lot of choices about um, how to make a building regenerative or not. Um, just so you know, um, carbon uh, materials that emit a whole lot of carbon, unsurprising, concrete, steel, huge carbon emitters um, in, in the creation of those materials. Um, what might surprise you is that wood, it can also be a very high carbon emitter. Um, on the other side, materials that have the ability to sequester carbon in a building are unsurprisingly the plant-based materials because that's what plants do. They remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and turn it into plant material. Um, and that carbon dioxide does not return to the atmosphere until that plant material breaks back down. Uh, and if your purpose is to make a building that is not gonna decompose, then you've essentially created a carbon sink if you've made that building out of um, uh, plant-based building materials. Uh, it does matter where they came from. So you'll notice that wood is also in this list. Uh, so if in the, in the best case scenario, um, wood coming from a sustainable supply chain is carbon sequestering. Uh, worst case, you know, terrible forestry practices, long transport distances, wood emits a lot of carbon. And so um, supply chains, again, are a big piece of this picture. Uh, okay, so um, that gives you very quickly the overview of how to think about buildings and where our leverage is for um, converting buildings to a regenerative component of our of the human resilient communities. Um, what we're working on now as a community to move toward the second of the two watercolors, one, proof of concept buildings. Um, and this is not so much proving that natural materials um, or carbon sequestering materials stand up and sequester carbon. It's more expanding the um, palette of what people understand is possible for the use of these materials. Um, people still think you have to live out in the forest and like, I don't know, they make all these assumptions about where you can use natural materials, which is inaccurate, but we don't have a lot of great, it, they're just urbanizing and diversifying now, you know, so it's really helpful to have good, um, like this uh, building here, about it in a minute is a commercial straw bale building in Oregon and you wouldn't know it by looking at it but um, all of its infill and interiors are clay and straw yeah so yeah here we go I'm talking about it here um, so uh, not only is this a good physical proof of concept building because it's not necessarily what people expect when they think of natural building um, but we're in the middle of creating um, what I call a carbon portrait not a full life cycle analysis to look at how much carbon got sequestered by this building um, and this is a preliminary assessment. We're still reviewing the numbers. Um, but if you compare just the, the wood, straw, and clay component, which in this picture, your metal clad part is straw and clay on the inside and wood framing, um, that, um, that, building sequest that component of the building sequesters about 12 tons of carbon. Um, and if you had built that out of what it would have been made from conventionally, uh, which is metal and foam often, or you know, sometimes wood and foam, or um, other combinations of industrial materials, um, that would have emitted about 65 tons of carbon. You know, so again, pretty high leverage. So a lot of what we want to do is take, make these buildings and then describe their impact, you know, because it, making them tangible, but having all the information is a really, I think, powerful way to communicate what we can do. Um, two, really begin thinking about the regenerative supply chains. Um, and so, um, Francis, I don't know where she went. Are you still in here, Francis? <laughs> Francis is one of the people who knows the most about wood and wood supply chains. So if she is around after and you have questions about that, she's a great person to talk to. My head's mostly been in straw um, so far because it's one of our most uh, widely used natural materials and it's got a really interesting, a lot of really interesting options for regenerative supply chains. Um, but anyway, you need to you need to um, invest in supply chains that have these characteristics, you know, that have a diverse soil microbiome that's storing carbon, not releasing it, um, that isn't disturbed in the harvesting process. Um, and in the case of agri, this is an agriculture slide. So in the case of agriculture, you know, increases other crop resiliency and water absorption, um, and stabilizes the whole um, agricultural ecosystem while producing a building material. And thinking about forestry is a similar pattern. Um, again, if you're not real familiar with regenerative agriculture, um, this is one of the older examples of a practitioner in North Dakota, and just what happened with his fields as he begins to add um, 
um, soil stabilizing regenerative practices. So the dotted line is um, and so again, when we're talking about regenerative supply chains for food or building materials or anything else, they're often, from the perspective of climate change, they're regenerative because the, the soil itself is able to remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it uh, for long periods of time. Um, so he's doing this in this case to produce, you know, um, fodder and, and grazing animals and other things. Um, but his carbon began to go, began to really jump upward, especially when he began to integrate multi-species cover crops and livestock integration. Um, and these ecosystems produce straw, among other things, you know, so you have um, a resilient um, way to produce a, 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 what is also a carbon sequestering building material. Um, so that, um, that ecosystem, just to give you, kind of pull the numbers together, sequesters about 10 tons of carbon per acre per year. Uh, and I think that was about the middle of the curve. Um, so if you go all the way to the top, it's actually more. Um, so the third thing we're doing, second thing we're doing is looking at how to begin to scale up regenerative supply chains. Third thing is creating technical content uh, that remove barriers to really scaling up quickly. Um, and that's writing life cycle analysis for um, materials like straw that are not, so a life cycle analysis is what describes kind of all the ins and outs of a material. Um, and they tend to be product based and they tend to be written by, in the building industry, they're written by companies who produce specific products. Natural materials, carbon sequestering materials, are open source materials. So they're supported by a community of practice, not an industry at this time. Um, and so it's nonprofits who are writing these LCAs. Um, there's a few different nonprofits engaged in this. And again, California Straw Building Association is working on um, straw and possibly some of the clay based um, LCAs. Um, but also figuring out how we fit into carbon credits. So again, just how do you, you know, if we have enough numbers to, to prove the carbon sequestering capacity of these building techniques, how do you begin to take advantage of the money available for that? Very pale. Uh, and for the, what we're doing now, so building the greater community of, of everyone who's gonna support this conversion of the built environments into a regenerative um, ecosystem. So the next slide. Um, if, <laughs> the slide, <laughs> the slides came through odd, yeah. Um, it, because, again, because there's not, because most of what happens in the built environment is driven um, by specific industries and products, there's not a funding community for drawdown building. Um, and, but there are multiple um, partners or potential partners uh, in the ecosystem of all the things that relate to creating drawdown building. People who benefit from it, um, people who are working on parts of it already and don't know it, um, people like Arup who are already thinking about, um, you know, the carbon impacts of building um, and need more partners to be able to just make more stuff, um, make more um, proof of concept projects. Um, really looking at who who is our uh, integrated group that's going to move this piece forward um, in building that community. Um, <laughs> I started making the slide and then was like, man, there's a lot going on. So what's happening right now, there's a few things and I got a little wordy. Um, but um, a mix of the things I just talked about. So there are two or three um, proof of concept building projects getting underway. Um, one's a partnership, two of them are partnerships in Sonoma that came out of looking at how to help people understand different ways to um, respond to just fires and other disasters. Um, so that's the um, CASBA and LIFT partnership with California Human Development and then the, the, the movable emergency housing that we're now partnering with the Lyme Foundation um, and other um, nonprofits in Sonoma. Um, in concept developing urban proof of concept projects, figuring out what that would look like um, with Arup and Stop Waste and some other people who are already developing municipal carbon plans for the greater Bay Area. Um, life cycle analysis um, and also just capacity building because all of the nonprofits and other people who kind of have held a lot of this information are um, active but not big groups of people and suddenly we're like, oh, we're in, in possession of this content that needs to scale very quickly. Um, and so one of the major stepping stones for that is just building the capacity of those entities that are, are have been working on this, you know, information for 20 years or whatever. Uh, and so, you know, moving, creating more paid positions within CASBA, um, you know, building the funding community for the built environment, which doesn't really exist. Um, and um, looking at how to support a lot of our other partner nonprofits and things like that. So. That's that. <laughs>
I love Massey how you started with like, this is real. This is, you know, this is happening. And I just want to point out like, same thing is happening in the fiber community. Right now I'm wearing a garment that was grown in California, biodynamic, biodynamically grown cotton intercropped with Sonoran wheat woven in Oakland. So, you know, let's, let's, let's start realizing these solutions in regenerative agriculture and connect with our farmers, the people that are growing our materials. Um, $45. Um, without further ado, um, Letitia is another one of those women that I met and was like, you're transforming the roofing and construction industry in Sonoma County. Oh my goodness. Um, so I want to have her come up and share her story. And we're so lucky to now be collaborating with her trades Academy uh, to bring what some of what Massey's work into what they're learning in terms of building um, and pathways into the construction industry. <laughs> so, I'm actually really excited to be here because you know this new relationship has been very special for me. Um, so I'm a roofing contractor. Um, I didn't wake up when I was 10 years old and say I want to be a roofer when I grow up. Um, I was and I grew up in a very small town in Lake County. Are you guys familiar with Lake County? Okay, so if you know anything about Lake County, you know there's not a lot, a lot of diversity up in Lake County. And my parents moved us from the Bay Area. Um, actually, I was born in San Pablo. And we lived in Berkeley, and they moved us up to Middletown in Lake County. And in a school, K through 12, about 800 kids. There were like six black kids in the entire school. And so I was severely bullied. I was physically, uh, mentally abused almost every day for several years of my life. Um, so I was about five years old when I moved there. And so a uh, teacher one day, I used to hide on the playground and one of my teachers would find me and she told me to come to her classroom one day. And she taught me how to play the trumpet every day in her class at lunch so that way I wouldn't get bullied on the school ground. And it completely changed my life. I was a very different kid. Now I was a lot, really outgoing. And I just knew I wanted to be a rock star when I grew up. So I started playing all kind of other instruments, piano and drums. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, rock on. And I uh, went to college at Sonoma State University and I was broke. I was a very broke musician. And so I needed to get a real job. And I started working for a roofing company as the receptionist. And I was basically answering phones. I was 20 years old. Oh, no, I just my age. Um, this is 23 years ago. Yes, I've been doing this 23 years. I started working as a receptionist answering the phones. And then um, after about four years, my boss uh, wanted to retire. And he said he wanted me to buy his company. Now, I wasn't a roofer. I knew how to answer phones. I knew how to run a business. I knew how to run a roofing company, but I was not a roofer. Um, but I took the chance and said yes. And for four years, he taught me how to roof. And I did that and got my license about four years later. So after about eight years, I was able to start my own company. So in 2004, I started my own uh, roofing company. And then I got licensed for sheet metal and gutters and solar. Um, so that way I could just be able to do everything in house. And so what was really fun ish was that I was the only female, <laughs> the only, I'm the only female um, roofing and the only African-American female uh, roofing contractor so far in Northern California. They're still checking Southern just to see. Um, but, <laughs> but in Northern, I can say, um, ARS roofing, solar and, and gutters. And um, so we, you know, I've had this successful business and I'm just like, you know, how can I give back or what can I do to give back to others? And basically how, um, what saved my life, I wanted to be able to find a way to save someone else's life. So I started a nonprofit called the Lion Foundation. That's my cue. Like, okay, <laughs> Lion Foundation, I'll do like this or something. Okay, um, the Lion Foundation and, and oh, here's my cue again. Lion Foundation is basically my son's name spelled backwards. Um, my son's name is Emil. He's 16 years old. That's him sitting in his car for the first time. And um, when he was in the second grade, kids used to tease him and call him Lion. And although I've been called a lot worse than Lyme, I did explain to him that is a form of bullying. And if he doesn't like to be called Lyme, he should let kids know. So when I wanted to name my nonprofit, I, I wanted to name it something that it was going to be dear to my heart forever. And that's why it's called the Lyme Foundation. So it's not about Lyme disease. It's just simply my son's name spelled backwards. So that's like. So basically, I have three programs. Naturally, I have a music program, my Turner Arts Initiative. Uh, Turner's my maiden name, and um, that's my that's my heart because I wanted to be able to give back to other you know kids that were bullied or um, 
depressed and find a way to, to channel a lot of that energy into something positive like music and dance and performance. Um, and then I have a senior activity program. My parents have been ill for most of my life, uh, whether it's heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and um, they're still fighting all of that. And I wanted to be able to find a way to help seniors be healthier in the community. So we have a, a, a yoga program and also a nutrition program, and we teach seniors how to be healthier. Um, but the most the, the, the biggest program that we have that just kind of took off, and it mainly took off because of the fires. So in 2017, we had, well, 2015, we had our fire, the Valley Fire, in my hometown, in Middletown, Cobb Mountain, that burned down. Um, a lot of my family, my friends were displaced, and my parents were camping out in a uh, parking lot of Walmart for a week and a half, and um, everyone trying to figure out if, if their house is still there. And we started a, a vocational program called the Next Gen Trades Academy for young people, uh, 16 to 24. That is still young. Um, and we wanted to be able to teach them how to go into an industry that was dying. We didn't have a workforce. And so the building process for 2015 fire has been so slow because there's not enough builders to do all the work. So how are we going to do all this building, you know, all this climate change building and green building if there's no workforce? So I had to take the matters in my, to my own hands and started training young people in the construction trades and teaching them about construction trades and how they can have a, a major career in this industry. And, you know, when I talk to young people about construction and I'd ask them, I'm like, you know, what's the first thing you think of when you think of a plumber? Every single time they say plumbers crack. That's the one thing. I'm sorry, I had to say it. It's the one thing that's like. That's where we are now. It's like construction industry is about plumbers crack, and it's not. They have, a, we have great, I mean, that still exists, but I'm just saying, you know, it's not what it's all about. And we had to actually teach these young people that there's an amazing career for them. And now we've had 83 students go through the program, and 63 of them, 63% of them have been placed into full time jobs with local contractors. So we're very proud of that. <laughs> it's a good number. Um, some of the ones that have been placed yet is because they're finishing their GEDs or they're finishing their uh, high school diplomas. So once they complete that, then they can move on to the next step and that we can place them in jobs. So we can go on to the next slide. So this is what we do in our Trades Academy. Um, so nationally, we had a second fire happen in 2017 um, in Santa Rosa. That's where I live. I live in Santa Rosa and Windsor. And so these students were needed more than ever because now we had all these structures gone. We needed to rebuild as quickly as possible. And again, we were already having trouble finding a workforce. We were already not being able to, there was no one to hire before the fires. So now you're talking about making that even larger. So we started training more pe young people. This is the Trades Academy. We'll go to the next slide. So this is what we do in our academy. Um, it's a 10-week program that they go through. It's after school if they're high schoolers, or we do it during the day or the afternoon, and they learn about all of these trades, roofing, carpentry, electrical, it goes on and on. Um, they also get safety and Cal OSHA certified during their program as well, which is really important to a contractor. Safety is the most important thing to all of us. Um, they learn about solar and green technology and green building, and then we bring in a lot of public speakers and also um, uh, like uh, different, uh, financial literacy, we make sure that they know that if they're going from making eleven dollars an hour to twenty five dollars an hour, they need to figure out how to save their money and not go broke. Okay, like I did in college, get that credit card and go shopping. But uh, I digress. Okay, next, and we're doing a tiny home build as well. So um, next slide. Um, so in these in these classes, we do different workshops. We do uh, emotional intelligence and anger management. A lot of these students are coming from disadvantaged communities and they're dealing with so many different things that they've gone through in their lives. So we want to make sure that we're setting them up for not not for failure. We want them to succeed. So we do a lot of different workshops in the pro, in the program, especially this personal growth one. It really helps them come into their own and figure out who they are. So um, so those are the workshops that we do. And the next slide, please. A couple things. So we get to do a lot of really fun activities. Um, <laughs> this is one of our classes that we do um, our restoration. Um, we have a restoration company. We have local contractors, CEOs of local companies that come in and, and talk to them every week. And so uh, this was a restoration company. We did this game called the Hoarder Game, and it teaches them 
they have to look for these tiny little pieces of paper and all this stuff, and it gives them an idea of what it's like in the field. They have to be in full gear, um, including safety goggles, and they have like a minute to find like these little pieces of paper and they collect points. It's a fun game, I love it. Um, but we do it every class cycle. Um, and then the next slide. Um, and then this is, they get their Cal OSHA um, cert certificates. So that way when they go to apply for jobs with these contractors, they're able to show that they've gone through and taken uh, safety very seriously because like I said, that is the number one important thing for us as contractors. Next slide, please. Um, we build portable uh, solar, solar kits. And it's really fun because we can use them out on the beach and we, they get the plug in all kind of little gadgets, but they build them from scratch and uh, we teach them in the class during the class time. And the next slide will show that we went to Eleuthera. We were able to take, two, we, got a, we had a grant that allowed us to take two of our top students and teach the portable solar class to a, um, it's called the Career Technical Institute in Eleuthera, Bahamas. And it was student led, so the teachers, the, the students led the entire thing. And it was, just, and they got to keep all the portable solar kits and they're using them now for their power tools and stuff in their class. So it's, it was really a special time for us. And then the next one, please. And then every year they, we have a big graduation. Um, the year before we had 18 students graduate and then 25 students graduate. And this year we have over 52 students graduating at June in our June. <laughs> so I'm very excited about that. Um, female, male, I mean, everything. Oh, no, you can just see in the picture, we have a, quite a variety. And of course, I have an emphasis on women, naturally, because I, there needs to be more women in the trades. They need to understand that they can do it as well. And then lastly is our tiny home build. And that's how Massey and I got in air and we all got connected because our, we want to be able to have our students be involved in green building and learning how to build. And we want to be able to build um, tiny homes for disasters relief because it's very much needed. And so um, I'm really, like I said, I'm really happy to be here today. And I really appreciate you guys giving me, giving me some time. And this is what we do. So that's that. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Um, so, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you so much for for working with the youth for for helping them envision. Um, yeah, this really important need that's really um, underemphasized. Um, so, I found out. Uh, I forget how I came across this um, second responder fund, but it was really. Um, momentous when I found it because we had been asking the question who is thinking about the rebuild and who's funding it and who's thinking about it in a different way so I want to bring up Cassie Cyphers with uh, Cliff with Cliff Foundation and to share with us a little bit about what Cliff is doing and then after she speaks we'll um, we'll break back in and hear from you Thanks for having me. I actually work for Cliff Bar and Company. We have a foundation, it's called the Cliff Bar Family Foundation. And the project that um, Aaron and I talked about is called the Second Responder Fund, and I'll talk about that. But I just wanted to quickly, I don't know if everybody knows, but um, I've worked at Cliff Bar for over 20 years, and we're privately owned, we're an ESOP company as well, so employee ownership program. And um, I just like this quote because it, it really is true, it's the way they run their company, the, the owner's Gary and kit. Um, kind of place we want to work that makes the kind of food we'd like to eat, strives for a healthier, more sustainable world, the kind of world we'd like to pass on to our children. And what I like about Cliff Bar a lot is that we're a five bottom line business. So it's sustaining our people, that's our internal people, planet, uh, business, brands, and community. So that's how we run our business. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the community work for the next slide. So has anyone um, seen or I feel um, like so much older than everybody here, but has anyone seen Make It Good or heard about Make It Good? So there's a really exciting thing happening. I'll talk about it. We, for the first time in 27 years, Cliff Bar has done a national ad campaign. So it's, it's um, and, it, and it feels pretty neat. It's a way to well, make it good and it highlights the good we've done and the good we're doing and the good that we'll continue to do. And I really like it because I think a lot of people don't know all of the work that we do around resilient communities and climate and organic agriculture and all of that other stuff. So I work on the community team under the community aspiration and um, we've donated over 49 million to support organizations that promote healthy, sustainable communities, local and global. I work for a woman who um, came from Vietnam when she was little and she's just like, 
super dynamic, always has big ideas and runs a little crazy with them, but we're, we're, we're lucky to be able to execute a lot of the interesting programs under her, as well as Gary and Kit. Um, I manage our giving program, our employee engagement and giving program, volunteering program. So um, since the start of that program, we've volunteered over 137,000 hours, community service. And what we do is we encourage our employees to volunteer on company time, and they don't have to choose any particular area. We sort of let them choose what they want, what they're passionate about. And that's, I think, what's really great about our program because they, they, they choose where they want to be and where they want to show up. Um, one million plus pounds of organic ingredients purchased. So while we know organic makes only a very small percentage of the entire agriculture situation, um, we're behind it. We put a lot of money behind it, a lot of advocacy um, and engagement and um, support of nonprofits hoping to move um, organic um, and make it bigger. Um, and then we've been 16 years climate neutral. And while I don't work on the climate programs, I used to work on planet and community, but we separated. I moved over to community 100%. Now we have some people that work on climate. So if anyone wants to know more about climate, I can talk more about it, the work that we do, or put you in touch with the person who talks about it. And then um, we've done it over $40 million, $49 million. So that's that slide. We can go to the next slide. So the program I oversee is Cliff Core. And the reason I, I really like this program is because we, we introduced this um, in terms of building resilient communities, we introduced this program called Returnship. So what we do is when employees are um, retiring from Cliff Bar, they transition to Returnship on the community team. So they're called Returns, and then they decide what they're interested in working on. So it might be strategic partnerships, might be engagement, it might be um, investments, and then we build a nine to 18 month program that helps them to learn more in those areas and work on the community team. And the idea is that they leave Cliff Bar and are more engaged in their communities, have hopefully found something that they're passionate about and then go deeper into that. So I really like that. And then the reason Erin and I talked is because we just launched the second responder fund. So I love this. Um, Gary is uh, spent a lot of time in the Sierras when he was young. He's good friends with the owners of Sierra Nevada Brewery, who are obviously in Butte County, Chico. Um, I think what I heard was, um, Chico absorbed, absorbed over, over 26,000 people from the various fire. You guys know this. And um, Gary was like, we got to do something. We got to join with them. We got to do something. We got to get the word out. So 100% of net profits from this particular flavor um, will go to rebuild communities after natural disasters. So the first project was um, Ken uh, Grossman, who's the founder of Sierra Nevada Brewery. He does a ton of stuff in Chico in terms of building and supporting people, but his wife is a huge animal lover. So he was like, we need to have something here that also addresses people and their pets after a natural disaster, which was a huge deal because people had no food. You know, they were clinging to nothing and they had their pets when their pets were pets survived. So what they did was they partnered with um, this, the Sierra, the Humane Society and they're rebuilding this humane society that's gonna be like a community revenue generator, it's gonna be a natural disaster sort of for the tri-state area so that it can respond to more natural disasters, we know they're coming. Um, and so we're gonna do that, and then each year, the sales from this bar will go to different projects that we identify to support after an ultra. And, um, we don't know what they're gonna look like, but we, I mean, Gary, he's the kind of person that just kind of flies by the seat of his pants. He's like, this is what I want to do. We pulled a team together, we built it, we made it happen, and now we kind of plan and, and execute, but it's a super exciting project. And I think that I put more slides. And then I just, I, I like Gary a lot. He's a cool person. I've known him and his wife for a long time. He's still very authentic and down to earth. I mean, he's a lot more money now, but um, <laughs> he, this is his, he, he's a climber. He's a climber, he's a cyclist. He does all that kind of stuff. And he, um, really doesn't like the whole Mount Everest situation because of all the waste there, which I know you guys probably are aware of. Um, so his sort of mantra in business after taking the white road is to learn to climb a different way and run your business a different way. So, that's all. so um, Thank you all for being here as well. And what we would love for you to do now is take a moment, again, in small groups and discuss now having heard the presenters, um, what questions are emerging for you? Um, 
what, what questions are coming up, what thoughts, what um, takeaways are emerging for you, and kind of discuss that in small groups. Um, I love the questions and the remarks on the board in the back of what is what makes resilient communities that you've already put up as you walked in. Um, so thank you for that. And um, yeah, so we'll take five minutes. Five minutes or so, and then we'll surface those questions that are coming up. So discuss, you know, uh, make sure every voice has an opportunity to be heard in the small group discussion. See what questions or comments uh, or things that you want to make a group aware of are coming up. Is that okay? Go.
Maybe, maybe 30 seconds to a minute to wrap up this to set up the discussion to surface questions. What you want to report that, if any. All right. Questions can be for anybody, any anybody who shared, or it could be a comment or a share for the entire group. Um, just looking popcorn style from your discussion groups, what came up? What kind of questions about what was shared or something you want to share? I love this principle of thinking, if I'm typically the one who has a little, have to get a little bit more of a nudge to speak out in a group, maybe this is your opportunity, you know, to stretch that edge. And if I'm the one that usually, I'm always the person to speak, maybe this is the opportunity to give a moment and have other voices join the, join the choir. Mm. So a comment about kind of our dependence on the nonprofit sector for uplifting, reflexive dependence, and and how we can grow to have other complementary structures uh, be at the for forefront of this innovation. Great, thank you. So, oh, um, uh, like learning. I 
But right now they're getting trained on the site. That's how I got trained. My boss and recruit out on the job site. So, and I learned, I feel that I learned better that way because I, it wasn't from a book, it was from real life. And that's every single one they are learning that way. They finish our program, then the actual company will train them directly. Learn very well, so. <laughs> or don't break, whatever. You know what I meant. You know what I meant. <laughs> very little bits of it are making their way into the university program. So very, a lot of it's hands on builders. Yeah. So that's one. You know, that's part of why this partnership is really exciting because it's looking at how workforce development can be scaled up for materials that don't have market share right now is an interesting chicken So it's partnering with the program. Did any of you want to comment or reflect on the first comment that was made too around the structure of the nonprofit or reflexive dependency on nonprofits to, to business move it forward? Or? I mean, coming from a profit world, right, construction, um, and then being part of the nonprofit world is really night and day, and, you know, because here I am doing construction, and I do their house, you know, their roof, and I go and get paid, you know what I'm saying? But then when it comes to nonprofit, I'm like begging, can you please give me $5,000? I, like, I feel like I'm begging, I'm begging, it's weird for me because I have to, I'm, I'm on both sides. So I, it's it's a struggle for a nonprofit world. Um, I'm working on a residual income with the tiny home building because that way we can build a home, sell the homes, take the profit, just keep recycling it through the program. But I don't have to go through that process of begging or that whole competition thing. Up in Sonoma County, there's all these different nonprofits competing for the same hundred grand. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to. Not having to do that. I'm looking forward. To I'm in line. Uh, yeah, you are in line. <laughs> a lot of small grants, but it feels uh, work on the foundation. I I work with that closely, and it does feel really hard. You're saying no a lot, and you're not getting very much money. And it feels like there's a death of mercy of these twenty-five hundred dollars grants. So I'll recognize that. That's my boss, and she's working on it. Capacity grant program, which is by application. So I don't know if that's what it's technically supposed to be called or what she's going to end up calling it. But the idea is that when she sees an organization that has the ability to scale, then they will be eligible for something like that. And it's a lot more money and it helps them to give, have the funding they need to not run around and rely on small checks from lots of people. I think that's uh, From the perspective of the carbon sequestering non proprietary materials. The nonprofit sector just plays a very specific role. You need to figure out what the products in that economy look like, you know, in the phase where they're just not going to be that profitable. It doesn't mean that we then just have to convert to the corporate model, but it's we're at a moment where nonprofit incubation is that we can, can have shared data and we can have other components. Yeah, um, maybe I'll share from the perspective of lift economy and the work that we do in field building or the next economy in general is we've kind of started to deconstruct our reflexive norms around structure in general. Uh, there's kind of oversimplified kind of basic literacy, like sometimes people come in with the idea of for-profit bad, uh, non-profit good. Uh, uh, or philanthropic good uh, and capital investment capital bad or those types of maybe simple ideas and if you start to look at uh, the edges of what's happening there um, we look at using the right structure in the right place um, and matching it up with the right type of capital and exploring the edges so we work a lot with uh, cooperative structures or other communitarian forms of organization and sometimes those take on uh, 501c3 structures, if it's worker self-directed 501c3s, where philanthropic or gift capital is the best means to provide the educational outcome or the charitable outcome um, that might be catalytic to unleash other type of earned revenue streams or earned income. 
similarly, we look at uh, you know enterprise models um, and actually partner with philanthropic capital in integrated type of structures, you know, integrated capital, to actually be catalytic to forming something new. A lot of you said that incubate, it's an early stage. It's it, That's true of a lot of the work in forming the next economy is stacking and integrating rather than segregating these structures and also exploring those edges. And that, that's kind of the work we do in the world of economy or the next economy. Might be sound esoteric, but I could give you a lot of case studies and examples of some of that, what's happening. Other yeah. other questions, things that came up. Yeah, the term Pollyanna. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to grab it? My understanding is a uh, uh, fanciful uh, kind of uh, Pollyanna is used to describe, I think, the idea that um, uh, not grounded in reality, but um, maybe um, fantastic. That wildly optimistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Existing residential buildings. What natural building materials create a more energy efficient building without increasing it? Well, the main reason is really how you build. It has more time than materials. Um, but, you know, it's a question. Yeah, we could speak to the yeah. human development idea. And, right. and this just, I love this question because it brings in this idea that we're, we're not just constantly looking to build new buildings, but we are looking, how do we retrofit existing buildings to make them less toxic? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like, well, uh, just from the perspective of natural materials, um, yeah, it's hard to give you a straight answer because there's so many different ways to, to, it depends on what you want to do to a building, you know, and how much you want to change it. Are you trying to increase its energy performance? Are you trying to, you know, contain toxins? Are you trying to, you know, improve indoor air quality. You can do all those things with different forms of natural construction. Um, but probably the most radical remodel would be, and um, this is something we're going to do with California Human Development. It's actually how my house is built, <laughs> um, variation of it. Um, and there are a few other projects in the works where you take an existing building and encase it with an insulating um, straw-based or fiber-based um, shelf to increase its insulative capacity. And that's typically to the exterior, just because otherwise you'd lose a bunch of, it doesn't have to be bales, it can be other types of straw insulation. Um, oh, and or some other type of insulating um, application combined with a, with a natural plaster or a natural surfacing. Um, so then there's like endless variants on that. Um, so you can do that. Um, you can totally add full um, you know, um, thermal systems with natural construction, or it can be as simple as putting in an earthen floor over an existing slab that's broken down, yeah. and adding radiant to it or whatever. So. Just to build on that too, we didn't show these pictures. Um, Massey showed them in many other presentations before, but there's this picture around um, uh, a natural building that survived a Lake, a Lake County fire. And you can see, I mean, the image is- Oh, Kevin just pulled it up. We were oh, talking about it. I yeah. It's really, really, oh yeah, I yeah. mean, it's really stark. Yes, yeah, so you saw it. So, I mean, that's another component that I, that I Yeah, we haven't really talked about the fire rebuild stuff, but it built appropriately, they, they're difficult to burn. Um, and then speaking briefly to maintenance, most natural materials uh, are low maintenance if you install them properly uh, for their content, which is a very generalized statement, but yeah. And then beyond that, it's what you Right. Yeah, we're well. A lot of what the urban working group would like to do is go vertical. You know, it's uh, um, there's no reason you can't do it. You wouldn't use the the most natural material structurally, so it'd be an infill system. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the, that's why I like to show that commercial building. You know, it's three stories and two of them are straw bale. Um, and you can go higher than that pretty easily. Yeah. 
structurally uh, yes yeah. right yeah. yeah so structurally it'd be wood or metal and there's some interesting things happening with wood uh, engineering right now that allow um, wood to replace and again Francis can tell you a lot about this um, the wood to replace what would generally be a metal frame going up many 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 more stories than was true until very recently there's a uh, building in uh, Eugene, Oregon, I believe it's car called Carbon 12. It's an eight-story ELT cross laminated timber frame for construction. Smaller ones in France. This is all in France. It's all insulated. Francis, come on up here. <laughs> you want to come on up here? Yeah. <laughs> You probably wouldn't do clay straw. This is where it can get into product-based stuff. No, actually, um, and again, Francis will probably remember the details more than I do, but there's a recent case study of, um, of do you remember how many stories that was, the one in France? The case that is a lot, like eight or something, but it's, yeah, it's a, but it, I think it was straight up, no, they did something with the straw that was a little bit different, um, but it's essentially an eight-story wood-framed straw in fields, guys, in France. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh huh, yeah. 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 Germany, um, New Zealand, um, Norway I didn't know about so much. Um, and there are a lot of building codes in, what's that? So you said that was the IBC? Yeah, the International Billing Code. International Billing Code. Don't hesitate to stop people if they use acronyms at any time, <laughs> especially tonight. Because we're just covering a lot of territory. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that slide because it's like there's all these pieces to the to like fire building and all these other things that yeah. we didn't even touch on. Before we go to another question, I just want to, did you want yeah, to add yeah. to the retrofit? Oh, um, uh, are we models? No, you typical tar and gravel, flat roof. Um, so when we re roof that, we put on a product, single ply product, which is the white reflective um, energy saving, and it reflects over 85% of the sun's rays. So every every flat roof that I do, I change it from whatever it used to be that single ply energy star rated. And then a lot of the pitched roofs that we do, we're doing a lot of like metal roofing, trying to get away from kind of the petroleum based stuff like hot mm -hmm. um, but everything's fire rated that we install. That's what we do. Grateful you're you're out there doing that work because that's one of the biggest key learnings that I learned after going through the Sonoma County fires is that it's not the forests that are catapulting these fires in a lot, it's the houses, right? It's the particularly the roofing material that's passing on these embers, and that's how the fire carries in the WUI, which is an acronym everyone should know. The wi wilderness urban interface, yeah, the wildland wild urban interface, the WUI. Oh, you'll, you'll be a uh, You'll get nerd points for that in fire. There is a question. Oh. Um, I'd say there are a few things. So the cost. Um, that Did you hear the question in the back? The Everyone cost knows. of natural building. Um, there's kind of a myth that surrounds natural building that it that costs nothing because the materials cost nothing, which is not true. Um, it costs nothing. The materials are not expensive, but materials don't make up uh, a huge component of the overall cost of the building or labor. 
Um, so if you're paying somebody to make a house and your design is not crazy complicated, um, natural building is comparable to um, conventional building in cost. Um, the, I would say the barriers, the reason it hasn't scaled up quickly is that until recently we didn't have any code for it, you know, so it limits very much. So certain forms of straw building were included um, in the International Residential Code um, five years ago, you know, and that's still being adopted by local jurisdictions, which is how the code transmission process typically works here. Um, and so that is a recently removed barrier. Until then, you could get permits for buildings, but they would be uh, through what's called an alternative means and methods application or something like that, usually, which needs to be, it's driven by specific projects. Um, and so a lot of what has driven the movement until very recently are either DIY, people who are building for themselves, usually without permits. Um, and there was a process where we had to kind of bring the materials into the culture and like prove that they mostly don't fall down or mold or like, goats don't eat them or I mean just like whatever right you know so we the DIY movement kind of got us through that and then especially around here there were there are a lot of very small dedicated architectural and engineering offices who have just learned the stuff because they cared about it and have been driving um, the the production of more desirable housing but it's mostly residential and because there's just because the way that works they tended to be high-end you know so we have these DIY projects we have high-end residential just because of the way the market developed um, and we're now really poised. So there's no real barrier other than just the way that the, the information has come into our culture. You know, so we're now poised to be like, okay, what does like affordable housing look like? How do we scale up? Regenerative supply chains are underdeveloped. Oh yeah, they're like yeah. So some of the costs of what we might see materials that are yeah. matching uh, carbon capture biodiversity criteria that we want. Those are probably going to be more expensive today and build out those supplies, which is happening kind of simultaneously, but maybe driven by watershed restoration or regenerative agriculture or, or, or other carbon uh, funding. So the supply chains are being developed simultaneously. Yes, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Um, so I think that's all the questions that I have. About that. <laughs> um, oh, they're all a pain. So they, <laughs> they have not been easier, that's for sure. Um, I really only have to deal in the permitting portion, but I just have to do the building. It's just I'm coming in pretty much. I do mainly the re roofing. I haven't been really doing a lot of the rebuild portion because a lot of the roofers blocked rebuild and left all the other people behind that needed to remodel. So I ended up getting all the remodel stuff. Um, but it just takes longer, you know, you know, where we can get an in progress inspection once we tear a roof off the day after or maybe two, now it's a week. And I'm sitting here with the roof wide open rain. Um, and that's the pain right now dealing with that. They don't have enough people right there. So that's all I really deal with is just that permitting process. But I just know things are taking a lot longer. And it's General um, initiatives in like Sonoma County planning that are support of incorporating more natural building, but it's they're there and you have to know they're there and you have to you know know how to incorporate them in a specific project, which is part of why we're working on proof of concept projects right now. So it's like you can just point to something and be like, this is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, have more of those. Um, yeah, massive point. So we mentioned it, but we are looking at partnering with a 50-year-old nonprofit, California Human Development, to do a proof of concept retrofit um, of a sober living center in uh, Northeast Santa Rosa, um, and then working with the Lyme Foundation to prototype uh, tiny homes and mobile samples of natural build materials. Sounds like it. Human development. Um, Maya and we have probably time for maybe two more questions, and then Nick. Um, 
it definitely play like a role, and from what I've heard, it's in, impeding even like. <laughs> Um, but um, I haven't had to tangle with it too directly yet because of the kinds of projects we're working on right now. Um, but yeah, um, a lot of what's happening in the natural building world is is what Kevin alluded to, where we're finding insurers who want to be the ones moving this forward. Um, and for for now, that's um, helping fill that gap, but that's going to stop filling the gap pretty quickly. So that needs to be flushed out for sure. <laughs> Yeah, and it's not my specialty. <laughs> so. so if you think <laughs> <laughs> yeah. any lingering last question? Across to you, like materials. Um, yeah, it's um, it's it often so uh, you know permits are issued by your city or your county, um, and each but each city or county has a particular culture in their building department, um, and um, and so something will be in the code or not. If it's in the code, then it's usually prescriptive and tells you have to, how you have to assemble things. Um, and well, that's actually less and less true, but you either do that or you want to do something different and then you get it engineered, um, which gets more expensive. Um, or if it's, uh, well, nonprofits, <laughs> in the case of that one, <laughs> or two different nonprofits who write code, or, um, there is a code approval process, um, and it's the internet, the international code council, um, accepts proposals for new materials. And that until very recently has typically been industry driven. And now uh, we kind of have a dude in the Bay Area who's become the like dude who writes code, <laughs> and he kind of stick over the second of my non like this nonprofit I'm on the board of that the Cop Research Institute, you know, Cop is like the most grassroots thing ever, <laughs> and does not have a code for it. But there's this little like very Berkeley dedicated nonprofit that's been around forever, moving at this glacial pace, um, the to um, make to write code. And um, Marty, who wrote a lot of the straw bale code, um, just kind of jumped over the CRI and said, okay, I'm taking over. <laughs> We're going to write the code for Cobb. Um, it was a little premature, I will say. There was a reason that it was moving glacially because we need more seismic testing and we need more numbers. Um, and also Cobb is, just from my perspective, like it's a great material. It's not as high leverage in California as some of the other natural materials. And so I've been less active in like really trying to think a bunch of energy into that than I think for some of the other stuff. Um, Side note, but uh, but to give you an example of how it happens, like that's kind of how it's happening right now. Um, and CASBA, the nonprofit that I'm co-director of, um, was the driving force for getting the they funded the writing of the straw bale code. Yep. Great. Yeah. 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 And actually, that's a great point. But such a good way to, to create templates. So there's that's happening in Marin too. And again, Francis and and I can tell you about this. There, um, other colleagues of ours are trying to write a low carbon concrete code, template code for Marin County. You know, and so I think that's actually an awesome way to begin to like create ground up code, essentially, as opposed to the top down ICC. And that's a great segue to one of the last questions I wanted to lift up, which someone put on the board there. So what practices can I integrate into my daily life to help foster resiliency in my community, other than supporting awesome organizations doing awesome things? So advocating for appropriate codes in your building departments and then having your uh, city councils take it to a vote is one strategy. Um, probably in partnership with nonprofits who have written the template code. Um, another thing that we wanted to share on behalf of Lift Economy is uh, we're hosting another one of these events in August, um, specifically for funders, so impact investors, philanthropists, the funding community. Um, and so if you are a funder and want to be invited to that, please let us know. And also, if you know of companies that wish to sponsor events like this, that's kind of how we 
um, make these events possible. Um, that's one way to get involved. Um, I wanted to open it up to the panel as well to close if there are other ways that you feel held to share right now around how anyone can get involved in their daily life to start building resilient ways. The connection. I think about um, everything I've been able to accomplish, and it's just because of collaboration. So it's just connecting us with people that you know share the same. You know, we're all here because we kind of share this passion. So um, I'd love to be able to be connected to you know other people that share you know, my workforce passion, and I'm sure you know people that you know. So that's a really great thing for me as a know someone then like, exchange that email or that phone call to um because that's for me okay. sorry no for it. um the casba uh, is a membership supported nonprofit, uh and so if you're specifically interested in the natural building um codes and scaling up stuff become a member and your membership feeds go toward that work so we're we're looking to increase our membership and also uh, increase the range of people that are benefited by our membership. And speaking to another um, rung on that circular diagram, we are having a webinar in two days called Who Will Own the Land? In our last event that we did, we actually talked about a lot more, went more in depth around commons ownership and you actually kind of um, uh, get intervene in the speculative real estate market that is keeping a lot of people off of access to land and off of accessing uh, land at an affordable rate and housing at an affordable rate. Um, and so if you're interested in that um, webinar, I sent out the link to everyone to, to join and register. The code to attend that webinar for free is commons. So join that webinar for free. There will be a recording sent out. Um, and yeah, join us. Uh, and so if you can't make it during the day when we host the webinar, you can uh, join, register, and we'll send you a recording afterwards. Um, in a lot of looking at commons ownership and commons uh, ways fostering the community. The question was, what can you do as an individual? Yeah. They say we work, that like in the, the capitalist society, something like 80,000 hours in our life, you know, 95 jobs, I think. One of you is going to get passionate about insurance. <laughs> you want to start a new type of insurance company, and that is going to be and, and we will help you. Yeah, we are so passionate about finding that person. <laughs> so much. Um, if anybody does want to stay and help clean up, no pressure, obviously, but we'll just stack chairs um, and, and I'll help you. Yeah. And we do these, these field building events seasonally, and we have different themes, different topics, building, and um, have one. Um,